Hello, everyone. We'll be starting soon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. There are people from different locations. For some, it's morning. For uh, us, it's afternoon. We are going on live on YouTube because there are some people observing. You're muted. Please unmute yourself. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Sorry. Sorry. So welcome, every day, everyone, to day two of our hands-on astronomy workshop. I hope you all enjoyed doing the things that we did yesterday and that you all went through them um, out in the open sun. And uh... so we continue a little bit. And then when we have the discussion session, that's when we will uh, talk about what experiments you tried and what results did you get and uh, opticon and other things, how do we explain it? So let's proceed a little bit further and then we will uh, discuss all that. Okay, so uh, yesterday I had said that we will do, I'll demonstrate to you Stellarium and I had shown to you that you can download it on your phone. So there are two versions. One is a free one. One is Stellarium Plus, which is uh, 650 rupees. I uh, think it's not much, but yeah, one time payment. But even uh, if you take the free one, it's good enough. Uh, but I'll just demonstrate very briefly uh, on the laptop. And uh, and we'll see what what can be done, what should be done. Okay, so I think you can see my screen right now. Can you see my screen? My desktop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see. Yeah. yeah. So so you if you are in Windows, this this can be installed in Linux, on Mac, on Windows, whatever. But since most people use Windows machine, I am showing it on Windows, but it's essentially the same thing. So for to start it, you generally click the start button. And when you say Stellarium or very often a Stellarium icon is created on your desktop when you install. So see it's starting Stellarium. And uh, you have to initially once you have to fix the location. So if you move your pointer, your uh, mouse, and get it somewhere below, you will see something pop up. And uh, there you have a location window. See, as I'm moving on my left side, it shows location. So when I click that, it shows you the map and it tells you which location. So either you can search for it. There is a, if you can see my mouse pointer, <laughs> there is a search, uh, a magnifying glass, and you specify whichever location you are looking at. Suppose you are in Delhi. So say it's your Delhi, India, New Delhi, India, right? So many cities all over the world are uh, given there. But if it is not given, then you can set it using the latitude and longitude of the place and the elevation. 
uh, even that would matter. So you have to find out at what elevation your city is or your location is. Suppose you are on a hilltop, uh, some 1,500 meters above sea level, then you have to fix that because the location of stars, the altitude of stars would change. Otherwise, it will give you something wrong. So uh, instead of Delhi, I will do uh, whichever city you want, uh, Cameroon if I want. So I, I'm doing, say, Hyderabad uh, because we are here. And when I say enter, it sets the location. Okay, similarly, you have to the set time, but time usually gets done by your system time. The computer has a time and this software is smart enough to set that. But below the location window, you will see you have a date and time also. So it is showing uh, 14, 8, 54. I can, yeah, the date is 31st, 10, 2020, and it's giving the current time, two o'clock, nine minutes, and three or four seconds. Okay, so this is set for present, and uh... sir, you have muted yourself. Please unmute. Sir, please unmute yourself. Ah. Yeah, so you see, so you can use your mouse and rotate the screen. You can zoom in, zoom out by using the scroll button. So now I'm looking at east, right? East, if I turn it northeast and, and northwest, and you can turn it around and see whichever location you are interested in. And it shows you some kind of a uh, landscape. And it, you, yeah. you, it shows you some kind of a landscape. OK. And you see the sun at this time in this location where we are, which is set in my computer. It is at a certain altitude. OK. So. Yeah. If I click, if I click the sun, then it there's a thing written which says type star, magnitude is minus twenty six point seven six. We will discuss what this means a bit uh, later. Absolute magnitude is four point eight, and right ascension, declination, all those yeah, things are given. Forty four. Forty four. Yeah, so azimuth, yeah, similarly, like this lady Sweta is doing, she's using her phone yes. and she's uh, getting the location. So on the phone, you will see what are the stars which are there. I can't do this with a laptop. The phones have that privilege of doing that. Okay, so, uh, okay, now if you get your mouse pointer again below here, uh, to the lower edge of your screen, you will see some icons. For example, one is a for the atmosphere. There's a cloud and a sun. Can you see this? And if I click it, it will it will uh, show the sky as it would be if there was no atmosphere. Right. So suddenly the sky turns dark. And even during the day, yeah, even, during, even uh, uh, so it, it shows you the sky. Then I have there are a few more globes on the left hand side. I can put the grid. So this is alt azimuth grid. That is at what altitude things are and what azimuth what angle from north direction. Or I can switch that off. I can switch on the other 
coordinate system, which is called the equatorial coordinate system. We will not go into this because in two-day workshop, uh, if we get into this, we will not. We would not proceed ahead. Anyway, so these are basically systems to locate objects in the sky. If you have to tell your friend at 30 degrees altitude and 45 azimuth, there is a comet, so they can see that. Okay, so this is for that. And then uh, there are sir, some, yes. Uh, sir, that means using our mobile phone and pointing it in that particular direction, wherever it is showing in our mobile, we should uh, focus with our naked eyes in that direction to see that particular planet or constellation. Exactly, exactly. Oh. So in that direction, like now you are seeing some star, it must be showing the star. And yes, that sir. star is there. You okay. may not be able to see because one, it is daytime, but the star is there. And in the night as the sun sets and the scattering of light, it goes, then you see a dark sky and you will actually see those objects. So do the same thing in the night. Yes, First sir. test it out with moon because you'll know exactly. Yeah, that is. So with stars, which you know, if you know, what is Orion, what is Betelgeuse, and if it is showing correct or not, you see it. Otherwise, you have to move your phone in a figure of eight. It says, do this, turn this, turn this, and then it calibrates because it has a GPS inside and it has a, it has a, uh, what is gyroscope and other things in it. So it okay. gives your location and things perfectly. Okay, okay sir. so yeah, and it's a beautiful thing. And uh, if somebody asks, "What is that object?" you can put it up and say, "Oh, that is Mars, or this is Jupiter." Ah, uh, sir, how many planets I'll be able to see, and uh, with naked eyes or with telescope, which you can suggest me? Naked eye, you can see only Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. There are five naked eye planets. Yeah, I heard every time, but I could not see any one of them actually. Oh, uh -huh. Near the moon. So in the evening, look at the moon, and uh, somewhere near it, you'll see this red planet and you'll see Mars. It's very nicely observable nowadays next to the moon. I will, I will, will yeah. look like small specks. You'll think they are stars, but by their brightness and the non twinkling of it will indicate that they are planets. So Mercury, you can see just after the sunset or just before the sunrise, sometimes if the orientation is correct. Venus also you see after sunset or before sunrise. Uh, Venus can be seen maximum up to three hours after sunset. But Mercury is much closer to the sun, so it sets earlier. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn are very easily observable objects. Uh, okay. And you can see it from brightness and color. If it's a reddish one, then it is Mars. Because okay. Mars basically has a lot of ferrous oxide. And it gives that reddish color. The sand there is rich in iron oxide, rust. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so even yesterday also, sir, I went upstairs because yesterday as it was Sharad Purnima and we yeah. celebrate. In Hyderabad, I used a Stellarium because yesterday you named this particular app. So I downloaded, but yesterday it was too many clouds in the Hyderabad. So I could not see anything other than moon. Yeah. But, but yesterday in Hyderabad, we ourselves saw near the moon. You see it near the moon. Uh, depending Early. on what time you are seeing it, we okay. saw around we about six, seven, seven, six seven, seven, seven. seven, but seven. near the moon, in short, near the moon, you're going to see Mars. I will go again once yeah, again. Yeah, I'll see go it, today. See it. it's, it's very nice, it's good. Yeah, I'll see it, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and do you have the kit? Uh, no, ma'am, I did not receive the kit. Okay, okay, fine. Otherwise, you could use your telescope. This anyway. telescope, which we shall make today, you can use that too. Okay, so now another thing you can do is in the screen with my scroll button, I can zoom into that location and I can zoom and see. See, similarly, you can do it on your phone with your finger, you can zoom in. You can search for a certain object. You can go and there is a, a search window or F3 when I click this. And if I say Saturn, and I I say Saturn, so it turns and shows where Saturn is. And when I zoom into it, you'll see the 
beautiful object Saturn is. See, you are seeing Saturn on the screen. And if you have a telescope, you'll be able to see. Depending on what is your telescope, you may either see it something like this or something like this or better, better resolved and so on. And what you see around here are different moons of Saturn. Saturn has a lot of moons. In fact, maximum number of moons are uh, in of Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn have a lot of moons around them. And this number keeps changing day to day. Uh, and then you can look into Titan, the moon of Saturn. See, this is, and it is running away because we are seeing it in real time and Earth is spinning. So I'm constantly holding it with my mouse. Okay, so I'll zoom out again. And uh, similarly, you can do it for Jupiter and so on. Okay, so since Earth has an atmosphere, the sunlight passes through these uh, grains of uh, uh, dust and all and gets scattered. The blue light gets scattered most because it has a shorter wavelength and there's something called Raleigh scattering which says how much of scattering happens for different wavelengths. And the shortest wavelengths get scattered most, hence the sky is blue. Even Raman effect, Raman also explained this scattering phenomena and he had explained why the sky is blue and, and uh, why the flowers have certain colors and so on. Uh, so this is it. And if, if we were on moon, that even during the day, the sky will look like this. Okay. So now I, what I shall do is I will uh, right below, there is a button that double arrow, which shows how uh, to speeden up the process of, of motion of the sky. You see, fast forwarding. fast forwarding it. I have made it too fast. Okay. So everything is rising in the east. Yeah. See, so you see it's rising. Venus has risen and the time it shows, what day, what time, right? So now Mercury has risen. See, it's a, you are seeing it in the morning these days. I'm, I'm reversing. Oops, sorry. So... And now, if you are going to stop it, and first, what you'll actually see first is Venus, right? Because Venus is further away from the sun. So first, you'll see, uh, this is your eastern horizon. What's the time? Ah, it's only 2.40 in the night. It's only 3 o'clock in the night. So it's still far from sunrise. 4 o'clock. Now just stop, stop, stop. So you see now this is Venus, right? Venus. So Venus is rising, right? And the time is 5.07. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. 5 o'clock in the morning. Right? In the morning. Now you see, let us see after this. Uh, we, we'll show you that you have, uh, yeah, we can go. Obviously, Mercury, stop, stop, stop. Now you can see Mercury, Mercury. is there, right? But so the big problem is because Mercury is faint far away and the sun is so close to it. The sun is going to rise, but Mercury is very, very faint. So that's how you'd want to search for Mercury. It has to be near the sun, either sunrise, sunset. Yeah. So the only naked eye uh, planets are these five, Mercury, Venus, Earth, we are anyway living on it, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Okay. And then the other two objects are Moon and the sun. And that's why we have seven days in a week. Week has seven days for no other reason, but because there were these seven celestial objects people have been seeing from time immemorial. So astronomy is in, in, ingrained into our concept of time, calendar, month, year, week, everything. So month has a month and year has physical connections, right? So in the sense the month is, goes with the faces of the moon, Similarly, the year go with the seasons, but the week 
has got nothing to do with any physical phenomenon. It just has to be do with this of the seven objects that are observable. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is it. And then you can uh, uh, think uh, if you have to find out, for example, uh, you want to find out uh, when will moon rise on a certain day, say uh, in on 12th of December uh, 2021, on 1st December 2021, when will the moon rise or the sun rise? You can set the date and you can and make it go. Okay. And then you will fast forward it and you'll see that. See, the sun is rising at 655. And you notice the sun is not rising exactly on the east. East is somewhere here. Sun is rising somewhere on on the off this side, right? Similarly, if I change the month, suppose I make it uh, say twenty first of March, I make this say March. Yesterday somebody said uh, twenty year, whichever year you want, two thousand and twenty. And I, you see, the sun has come close to the exact east, not exact. So maybe if I make it 20th, no, 20, 22nd March, see, 22nd March, 23rd March. Hmm? So somewhere around 21st. You can find out what is the, yeah, 25th March is when the sun was exactly in the east this year. And similarly, in uh, September again, this will happen when 20, on 22nd, okay, 20, 27th, 28th, 29th. That's August. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's why I was wondering what is happening. Yeah, so you can see that it's coming closer and closer. 21st September apparently is the ninth, ninth month is August, September. September. Yeah, so you can see and you can use this to even demonstrate to children how it changes. Now, if I change the month to say sixth month, you will see the sun is in the northeast side, right? Northeast. That's why it's, it is summer in the northern hemisphere. And if you go beyond September, if I go to October, it is already in the southeast side. And it is becoming summer in southern hemisphere and winter in northern hemisphere. So this is the option called the Uttarayana and the Dakshinarayana, right? The period one and it goes to the Uttarayana and the period two and the period three and the period the north side and the east side. Yeah. So it moves from. And east similarly, you can turn it around to the west side, and you can see, sorry, uh, you can see the setting of the same thing and. Uh, the same thing would happen on certain days. Uh, these things will set perfectly, and on other days it will. Okay, and then there are these constellation lines which you can. Uh, you can set the constellation lines. And you can set the constellations. Why is this button? Yeah, wait, I'll remove this astronomical calculations. So it does it, it does tremendous amount of things. And you see, you can switch on these figures. Hmm? The Taurus, the Bull, Orion, the Hunter, these are constellations. 
and obviously there are no rabbits and uh, uh, bulls and hunters there it was just the imagination of people who first looked at these stars connected them with line and this thing appeared as though the belt of a hunter this is the sword of the hunter and they imagined it to be a, a hunter with a club on hand and and in different cultures the names are different like in in, in india we have sapta rishi seven rishis sitting and meditating because they always rise and sit together and in the western one this is the great bear it's the one part of the great bear constellation and if you look at the constellation in the southern hemisphere they have more modern names yeah because the southern hemisphere has been explored much later most of the work which we have is centric to the northern hemisphere what uh, uh, europeans or uh, indians or arabs catalog catalog right so these are just so you can switch on these lines you can switch off these lines and uh, and you can see the rising setting and so on and there are a lot of experiments you can even if you have a telescope which can be connected to your motorized telescope then you can uh, even use celerium to uh, change the direction of telescope using this one right you can make an interface and do it so maybe with this i will stop with stellarium and uh, welcome you to i mean insists that you try it out you all have to install it and uh, you have to install it and and play around with it and there are a lot of things available on net which will tell you how to do what to do or you can come back to us and we can tell you the innumerable projects which can be done for students using the stellarium okay so that's for uh, this thing now we'll go ahead and i will have a small uh, presentation we yeah we'll talk about light and Oh. And the uh, light form is based on what we are going to do with our telescope. Yes, yeah? so we can just try to understand light. Ma'am, your voice is not clear. Okay, okay. Am I louder now? I think I am very loud. No, Priya ji. Yes. Priya, whenever, whenever you talk from the side, we can't make out. Only the oh, bubble. Oh, oh, okay. Straight okay. into the microphone, we can hear. Yeah. Okay, because generally I have a very loud voice. That's what I'm told to by everyone. <laughs> I'm surprised that people have a problem, but yeah, probably the mic is a smaller one. So what we're going to talk about now is, since we've got to make our telescope, we are going to talk about light and try to understand how does a telescope work. So, yeah, I'll share my screen and. yeah so uh, what is light yeah yesterday uh, mr rahul chatterji had raised some uh, questions and we discussed and i had mentioned that for a major part of our history of astronomy we have been using light to understand uh, our skies and hence the universe so essentially the light which comes from the stars has played a very big role in developing and forging the scientific thought there's a beautiful quote by henri poincare a mathematician of great repute a french mathematician he says that the light which comes from the stars does not only strike our physical bodily eye but it also illuminates our mind which is much more subtle uh, right so the star showed us patterns they always rose in the east and always set in the west there were some which were not obeying this perfectly and they were called the wanderers and we realized that these wanderers were planets 
and trying to explain why these planets move the way they do, we understood the laws of gravity and so on. Once we understood laws of gravity, we could put our artificial satellites, we can have our communication systems in place because of that. And, um, uh, and we have our uh, Uber delivering us food and Ola taking us to where we want to, all because we have understood the motion of uh, these planets, understood what gravity is. And once you understand these laws of nature, we can use them to our benefit and command nature to do what we want it to do, uh, which suits us. So what is light? Uh, light, we look at two aspects of it, reflection and refraction. Light has uh, a dual nature. It acts as a wave and it also acts like particle. For a very long time, this uh, issue was on. Newton believed in the corpuscular theory where he thought light is transmitted from the object to another location through small particles. And uh, Huygens in the same time, he believed that light travels as a wave. And both uh, fought over the issue in those times. But today we realize that both were correct in their own way. So certain property of light can be understood in, as, as, as small particles, like small balls which carry this energy, photons. And uh, certain phenomena, for example, diffraction and, and uh, interference and other things mm -hmm. can be understood when you see light as a wave. So as we know, uh, light is essentially uh, is an electromagnetic spectrum. Or is some slides have gone. Yeah, so yeah, basically there are some slides here which are apparently not showing up. Light is an electromagnetic wave in which electrical impulses and magnetic field, they, they move perpendicular to each other. And as they fluctuate, the whole thing moves. So it is basically uh, energy which is being transmitted. And these are electromagnetic waves. Depending on what is the wavelength uh, of, of the wave, we see uh, different colors to it. So what our eye sees a very small uh, aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it sees from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So 400, uh, uh, right? So I wonder what happened to my, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these slides are gone. Anyway, yeah, okay, so no, no problem. So what I would be uh, concentrating on basically is uh, the wave aspect of it, uh, wave aspect, because I'm, I'm more interested in talking to you about the spectrum. So we know what spectrum is. We have shown this in our schools to our uh, school children, but somehow we never get to do these experiments with them and show them what they are. It is a present. Yeah. So if you pass, if you pass uh, light through a prism, it breaks up into a spectrum. So you have prism and as light passes through this prism, you take a wide beam of light and hit it at an angle and it breaks up into a spectrum. And uh, this is called, this was observed by Newton and uh, this spectrum basically shows that that light which we have is composed of many wavelengths and different wavelengths have a different amount of 
uh, yeah, so basically when it's going from air to glass, the speed of light changes. In, in different mediums, it's different. And different wavelengths change by different amount, right? So the blue one changes maximum. That's why it splits up to bend maximum. And the red, which is larger wavelengths, it shifts by the least amount, right? Other way of doing the same thing is getting the spectrum is by using a diffraction grating. If you take, uh, if you take a grating, if you take a uh, lot of thin slices and uh, pass light through it, then even that breaks up into a grating. We have a grating too now. Another way you can see is you can take a, a CD and uh, you will see if you focus it on light, you will see a rainbow appearing there. Here. Right? You can take a, a CD which we have and you look at it against the light. I, I think you can already see that. The light. See that? You see a whole range of spectrum coming here. So basically, it's uh, the different wave uh, components. Right. So keeping this in mind, we'll proceed ahead. And uh, what do we see here? Uh, I have a photograph of a ocean of sky uh, from a very uh, location where there's not much of dust pollution and, and uh, light pollution. Hence, you get this spectacular image. And these are stars. Unfortunately, we can't see stars this way from cities now. But if you go to some uh, location which is far from city lights and pollution and take a long exposure, uh, you get this thing. So what are we observing here? Two things. There's a difference in brightness of stars. Some stars are brighter than the other. The second thing which we observe are the colors of stars. Some stars look yellowish, reddish, some stars look whitish, bluish, right? So this is not an illusion which we are getting, but this is something very important and interesting, uh, which gives you a, us a tremendous amount of information about stars and our universe. So brightness of star, uh, it depends on two things. One, the star's distance from us. Obviously, stars which are closer to us will look brighter. And the further the star is, it will look fainter. Right? So that one thing is the distance aspect. A star looks brighter or fainter if it is closer to us and far from us. And this was thought, this was what astronomers thought for a very long time. They thought that all stars have same brightness but they are looking fainter or brighter because they are at different distances. And with that, they made some maps of our universe, of our Milky Way galaxy, which were partially correct, but they were not absolutely right. Because there is one more aspect. Stars, some stars are intrinsically brighter than the other stars. So stars intrinsic, their self brightness may be different. Right? So some stars are brighter, some stars are fainter. So it is not just the distance which dis defines whether the star is faint or bright, but it also defines uh, their, they themselves maybe. Yeah. So why can a star be brighter, uh, intrinsically brighter? We'll come to this. And the answer to that is either it depends on the temperature of a star. The stars may be very hot or they may be cold. So there are some stars which are, say, 3000 Kelvin uh, on the photosphere, and some have uh, photosphere temperatures of about 40, 45,000, right? So the stars themselves, depending on the size of the star, the mass of the star, they may be hotter or, or uh, cooler stars. 
second thing is the star size can be different two stars whose temperatures are the same but if one star is small and the other star is big the bigger star will look brighter because it has a larger surface area from which it is emitting uh, light okay so we'll come to this uh, further uh, as we proceed ahead but these are the two things which are important and the third aspect which uh, i shall not discuss in detail here is between stars there is medium there is some interstellar medium and sometimes uh, light from very hot stars as it passes through this medium it gets absorbed and scattered so a whitish blue star which is a hot star may appear to to appear as a red star so the third one is the interstellar between the observer and the star they can be clouds and dust and they can be interstellar medium which scatters and absorbs light and makes the star look fainter one thing or uh, redder so this absorption always leads from bluer to the redder side it always makes it can make a thing look appear it cannot make it look bluer okay so coming to the distance there are some stars which are closer to us and some stars at tremendous distances and the question is how do we find distances to stars and the distances to stars are found uh, to nearby stars are found by using parallax method something which we were talking about yesterday if you keep your finger in front of you at a certain distance from you and move your head you will see that objects behind the shift and you will notice that the things which are closer they shift by a smaller amount and the ones which are behind the shift by a different amount so you see a picture here of two people looking at the top of a tree from two different points and um, one sees uh, the tip of one mountain aligned with the tree and the other person sees some other mountain which is aligned with it and this angle which you see between these two is the angle of parallax so if the same person had stood here and observed and moved here and seen again he would have seen that the tip of the mountain has shifted by a certain amount and by what amount it moves will tell you what the distance to this object is okay so the distance is 1 by p p is the parallax angle so the if you are shifted by the half what you are seeing here the angle there is 2p twice p and uh, okay so this will give you uh, the distance to that and uh, the, the parallax is measured in arc seconds and the distance have to be measured in parsec parsec is a unit of length which is about 2.3.26 light years so and a light year is the distance traveled by light in in one year okay so this distances to planets distances to nearby stars are found using these parsecs so you you have a backdrop of further of objects and you see how, by how much amount uh, the, the star shifts and this will tell you uh, this will show you uh, this will show you how just a minute sorry by what amount it shifts okay so uh, in fact we can see depth humans have bifocal vision is because we have two eyes separated by a certain distance and you have one ray of light which shoots out from one uh, get enters your eye from this side and the other one enters here and our brain measures this angle which the two rays meet and it from that it calculates and says how far it should be and it is out of experience we can say it is 2 meters away 10 meters away or so on and the objects which are further off they subtend a smaller angle ones which are closer they subtend a, a larger angle 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so but we have a limitation. We cannot move our eyes ahead. We are fixed in a frame. So, but what can we do is we, we can close one eye, observe from one point, and then you can walk a few meters and observe from some other point. That is increasing the baseline of your observation, right? So, uh, if you notice uh, that. Of, so to increase the parallax angle, there are two things which can be done. One is we we uh, we increase the baseline. So I will stop sharing this and I will share the whiteboard for a minute. And uh, so. So this is my baseline. I have these two points. And if there is an object here, this is my this is my angle of parallax. If the object was further off, you will notice that this, this angle becomes small. And after a certain distance, your eye cannot measure this distance at all. You'll, you'll, you'll stop seeing, you'll not be able to measure this thing. Okay. So for that, what can we can do is we can increase our baseline. I can observe from here, then I can observe from here. So for the, for the same object, I can, I can increase my parallax angle, right? So this is my parallax angle. This is my P. Okay, so from midpoint, I move equal distance here, move equal distance here, and this gives me the, the parallax angle, right? So you keep increasing the base. And uh, what we do is we use the rotation of the revolution of Earth around the sun to our advantage, and we increase our baseline by measuring on 1st of January, you know, somewhere in January, and then in June, and we have a baseline of almost 300 million kilometers. Yeah, the radius is 150 million. So we are getting a baseline of 300 million kilometers. Okay, so this is the way you can find distances to uh, relatively closer stars. Because if the star becomes further and further, that this angle becomes more and more difficult to measure. Okay. Then you can do something like, uh, we know that our sun is moving around the galaxy. Yesterday, Priya Madam uh, showed that our sun is sitting some uh, eight kiloparsecs from the center and we are revolving around. So if we can observe at different epochs, you observe now and after 30 years again, you observe you can see distant galaxies from different vantage points. This is used for extra galactic distances. Okay, so yeah, so uh, parallax is one method. Other methods of finding distances are uh, using C feed variables and so on. Okay. Now coming to the brightness, technically the terms used in astronomy are luminosity of star. Brightness of a star is what is its luminosity? How much energy is it emit emitting per second? Or the another term which is used is magnitude, magnitude of a star. So this concept of magnitude was, was introduced by a Greek uh, astronomer Hipparchus in the second century BC, where he observed that the stars have different brightness. The brightest objects, he called them magnitude one stars. And the ones which were slightly fainter, he called them magnitude two stars. And still fainter were three, all the way till sixth magnitude. And those which were fainter than six, a normal human eye can't see. You can't see with a uh, 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 by you know, stick. some people may have very good eyesight, or you have to use lenses, 
glasses, telescopes, binoculars to see even fainter objects. So normally a human eye can see up to sixth magnitude. So number is bigger, but it means a fainter object, right? One is a bright star, six is a faint star, something which you barely can see with naked eye. Okay, now magnitude has, we have two types of magnitude. One we call apparent magnitude and the other one absolute magnitude. Apparent magnitude, the word itself indicates, it means what appears to you. Magnitude, what appears. So we are sitting on earth, we are at a certain fixed distance from the celestial objects, of object, and uh, what appears to it, what brightness that star appears to it, us is called apparent magnitude. But then that is not the measure of its intrinsic brightness of the star, because we are interested in knowing whether the star itself is bright or is it faint, or is it just happening because of the distance from us. So the second thing is called the absolute magnitude. And the absolute magnitude is, uh, I'll come back to these slides again. If, if you place uh, the object at 10 parsecs from us, 10 parsecs away from us, the apparent magnitude which you would see is called the absolute magnitude. So you have stars at different distances, some stars so you have a circle in this uh, chart uh, on this slide. The center is where we are. And uh, we have a circle of 10 parsecs, 10 parsecs, yes. One parsec is 3.26 light years. And one light year, year is the distance traveled by light in one year. Light travels at tremendous velocity of 300,000 kilometers per second. So if it travels so one year, the distance it travels is called one light year. And it is approximately 9.46 trillion kilometers. Yeah, trillion is million is six zeros, billion is nine zeros, trillion is 12 zeros. So you, the stars which are close to us, you move it to 10 parsecs and then what apparent magnitude we will measure will be its absolute one. Similarly, objects which are far from us, you move it to 10 parsecs and what it will appear to us will be its absolute magnitude. Okay, so apparent magnitude is what appears to us. And we have these six magnitude scales, which I mentioned, Hipparchus had these six magnitude scales. The brightest stars were magnitude one and the faintest stars were magnitude six. And today our magnitude system has evolved because now we have photometers. We can measure brightness, not just by looking at it and judging uh, what is more bright and what is less bright, but in a very quantitative way, we can have a collect flux for a certain time and actually measure. So you have a magnitude between 1.4, 1.23 and, and so on. And then since Technology has improved, telescopes have improved. We can see objects much beyond the naked eye limit. Yeah. For example, uh, with, a, with a, a, a 12-inch telescope, we can see up to 13 magnitude. Uh, with a telescope which you see here, telescope which you see here, you can see up to, this is a three-inch, we can see up to maybe um, eight, eight magnitude or so. Okay. And the Hubble Space Telescope can go up to 28 magnitude. So Priya will be talking about telescopes when she will tell you uh, how you can calculate and see how the diameter uh, of a telescope can tell you to what brightness you can see, brightness limit. You have a scale here and uh, you see zero magnitude, uh, Polaris is second magnitude, naked eye limit is the sixth magnitude, Venus is minus four magnitude, 
full moon is minus 13 magnitude we see a negative big number shows bright and brighter object and minus 26 is the sun's uh, magnitude sun's magnitude minus 26 okay so 20 meter telescope i mean a 1 meter telescope you can see up to 20 magnitude and uh, this Keck and Hubble limits are up to 28 to 30 magnitudes. Okay, so, and uh, this is another picture where it's so serious is uh, somewhere close to Z, one magnitude. Vega is brighter than, uh, yeah, it's minus, Venus is minus, as we saw and so on. Moon is minus 13 and sun is minus 26. There are certain quasars which are very distant objects. So they are plus 10 magnitude, right? Which we can't see with a naked eye, but with a good telescope, we'll see. So these quasars are extremely bright objects, but they are extremely far. That's why the apparent magnitude is very low. So it is giving us a wrong impression that it is faint. But actually, really speaking, it's not faint. It is extremely far. So it is necessary to rescale everything into absolute magnitude. And then you can actually say how bright or how faint one object is. And why is it so bright? What energetic phenomena is going on? And what is it leading to its brightness? So now this is a table which gives you apparent and absolute magnitudes. So sun's... Apparent magnitude is minus 26.93, but absolute magnitude is 4.8, right? So the sun looks by, is so bright to us, minus 26, almost minus 27, it's because it's very close to us. And if we move it to that 10 parsec limit, then it will be 4.8. It will be a very faint star, yeah, almost five magnitude star. You will just barely manage to see it. Sirius is minus 1.44 and its absolute magnitude is 1.44, right? And Vega is 0 0.03 and its absolute magnitude is 0 0.58 and so on. So when you look at the absolute magnitudes, then you will actually say, you'll be able to see which is the brightest one. So you will notice here, that Betelgeuse, which is minus 5.1 absolute magnitude, has the maximum brightness. Yeah. Uh, compared to even, yeah, it's okay. Luminosity is very high. Yeah. So, why are these uh, stars? They come in different sizes and colors because they have different temperatures, which gives them the color and different sizes which they gives them their luminosity. So if our sun was as given in this picture, then this Wolf 359, a, a, a small uh, dwarf star, would look like a pea as small as this, while Sirius would look this big. If you rescale Sirius to the size of a pea, then Arcturus would look this big, and Aldebaran uh, is much bigger than that. If you reduce the size of Aldebaran, rescale it to look like a P here in the frame below, left-hand side below, then Antares is much, much bigger than it, and Betelgeuse is still bigger than that. You rescale Betelgeuse, then you get these mu C feeds and BBC feeds, and VY Canis Major at uh, these scales. So if we had started off with sun this size, then we couldn't have drawn VV Canis Major in the screen. We would have required a screen as big as probably this whole building to do it. That's why we have to put it in different snapshots to show the, what they are, right? So the stars come in a variety of sizes. Some are, so our sun is a very ordinary star. There are stars which are much, much larger than it. And there are stars which are smaller than it too. 
Second thing which we mentioned was the color of stars. And the color, as I said, it can be due to interstellar absorption, but also because of their intrinsic temperature. Okay, so. So some, some, somebody's. Yeah, there was some disturbance. So, uh, yeah. So temperatures. So different stars. Those stars are black body radiators. They emit in all frequencies, but depending on their photosphere they emit more in a certain wavelength. And that depends on the temperature of the photosphere. And that gives you the color of that thing too. For example, our sun uh, photosphere emits more at uh, 6,000 Kelvin. That's why it is a yellow star. And so the, the peak, it keeps shifting. As the temperature changes, it peaks at different ones. And that's the color which we see. So uh, here is a scale which shows how the wavelength, yeah, so this is an electromagnetic spectrum. And if the wavelength is very small, what we have are gamma rays, which is 10 to the power of minus six nanometers. Then we have X-rays, 10 to the power of minus one to around that scale. What we have been observing the universe for a very long time is the visible light, what our eye can detect, and which is a very, very narrow uh, band, very narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the range which our eye can detect. If the wavelength is shorter than a certain wavelength, our eyes can't see it. If the wavelength is larger than a certain wavelength, we can't see it. But all the same, there's radiation coming in. So if you go from violet to further to shorter wavelengths, you get ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. These are very high energy and uh, uh, waves. And if you go from red, you go to infrared, then you got microwaves, then you go to radio waves. So radio waves have wavelengths up to meters or tens of kilometers, right? So, so uh, but today astronomy is done not just in the visible, but there's infrared astronomy, there's radio astronomy, there are the people observing in X-rays and gamma rays. And so you have the whole spectrum open and hence you can see very hot objects which are emitting in X-rays or very cold uh, gas, which uh, shows up in radio. You have clouds of gas, which are forming stars, which show up in, in uh, ultra, uh, in infrared. And you have very hot stars, uh, uh, which show up in ultraviolet and so on. Okay, so uh, we are living at very interesting times. So the temperature and the color, they are totally dependent from the peak where it's peaking, we can say what the color is. And from the color, you can say what the temperature is. So that is tremendous amount of information from the spectra. Okay, so uh, when you look at the spectra, spectra can be got, as I mentioned, you have starlight and you pass it through a prism and you get the spectrum of it, right? Or clouds of gas or stars and objects. And then you have two types of spectra. One is absorption spectra. You have the spectrum and you have some dark lines which appear there, which show absorption lines. So as the light is passing through medium and that medium has some elements there, then those elements absorb uh, certain frequencies to go from one state to another, like hydrogen, uh, you have the electrons which 
go from spin up to spin down state and it uh, it it absorbs those energies right you have the h alpha emissions you have right so the absorption line where it is appearing tells you what is the com chemical composition of the medium between the light and between us so what is the atmosphere of our star so they can be lines which are sodium lines they can be carbon lines and from the thickness of the line you can talk about the abundance of it there's a lot of sodium there a lot of carbon there or basically it is hydrogen and helium or what so each chemical element shows its signature in the spectrum and these spectra are extremely important another one is the emission spectra where you see instead of dark lines you see bright lines for example here you will observe there is a brightish yellow line right so there here these elements are getting excited getting heat, heating up and they are emitting it rather than absorbing those elements of right in one you you have light coming through and it is removing certain frequencies another one it is going through certain medium or certain objects which are emitting exciting those chemical elements and giving it so uh, yeah so here's an example of uh, uh, of a spectra and these lines will show you uh, what these objects are these are these are sodium lines so they they come exactly at 590 right whereas calcium lines around 400 so looking at these absorption lines we'll be able to say uh, what is this thing yeah so now i want to show that you can make a simple spectrometer yourself it is uh, very simple you can take any box uh, this is a this is a box which i have have taken hmm? and this is a box okay so i have a i have a box here some t t box and what i did is i have made a slit here i just just take uh, uh, take a thing and slit it out make a window here for light to pass through it okay and then i took a it is not there in the kit but take an old cd these are anyway getting primitive and i just sliced i slice from both the sides whole so that i can put this like that okay and on top of it i made a window i made a window so that i can see the spectra see the basic idea is i can see the spectra even this way i you can probably see the spectra but if i can put it in a dark thing and i see it i'll see the spectra very clearly so this is the window which with, with which i am going to see this slit is to let the light fall into onto your uh, cd you have can adjust the angle in such a way that that uh, it is most conducive to you to observe so you can see beautiful spectrum here priya can you one night here is is say is no 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 not night you can you can use the duet camera good camera is on i think just a minute we we will try to switch on it's not coming droid camera Yeah. 
Did it? You show it here. Flip the camera. And I just put it like this, so you can also this box, right? And I just remove the CD a bit. As you can see now, the CD has been put inside. Ma'am, so please speak in mic. Speak is good. Yeah, that is good. Mm. Uh, so I hope it is clear to you all how this has been done. He has basically cut this. Uh, what are you doing? One minute. We we are using another camera to show this to you all better, and we just do that. Just 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 give us a minute. But this mm. is something which is not there in the kit, and you can try doing it yourself. Uh, Show it to you and start it again. Sorry. What it is exactly, ma'am? Getting spectrum with CD? Yeah. So actually, see, like like I explained, if you look at the CD, you can anyway see the spectrum, right? You can see colors. Yeah. But basically, by doing this box, you're making it dark so that you can see the spectrum more clearly. Otherwise, here what happens, you'll have only thinner strips where you can see it. While if you put it in this, you'll have a larger strip where you can see it. So the other camera, you you can if you can peep through this, then yeah. you can see the spectrum much more beautifully. Okay. Sir, what you are trying to show, I did not understand. Can yeah, you tell me once again? Just a minute. I will start the. Just a minute. Okay, just a minute. Just one minute. Yeah, here yeah, it is. So what we have here is a CD. And you see, when I, on the CD, you can see the rainbow colors. Can you see that? Rainbow colors, this is just light. Yes, sir. Reflecting. Yeah. But I am seeing many other things which are reflecting from the CD. Isn't it? So if you make a... What I have done is created a box like this. One slit is for light to enter. And this, this is to enter the light and I'll focus it towards the light this way. I have made a slit through which I can put my CD inside. Yeah, I put a CD inside and on top I have created a window from which I can see the thing. So now when you see through that, you can see the spectrum in a much better way. Yeah, can you see what there is? Yeah. I hope that's clear, right? The upper, the upper window is a bigger one, this one. The side slit is a smaller one, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, if. Um... Yeah, see, see. Hmm. Inside the box, you can see the rainbow colors better. See that? So, yeah, so basically, 
Uh, so, sir, this light source you are using, are you putting it in front of the sun? And I'm using the bulb right here. If you put it in front of the sun, then you can see even the uh, front of her lines. You'll see some black lines which show uh, hydrogen lines. Is it dark fringes? Yeah. So using this, so I'll go back to the presentation and I'll show you the ray diagram of that. See. Brownhofer yeah, line, I did not expect any time. Yeah, see, see that you you take a box, you see a you see a box, huh? You have sunlight to come through, any light source to come through, and you have a CD at an angle, say at a 60 degrees or so. So the light comes here, 60 degrees, and then you have a window here from which you can see it. Okay. And the CD acts as the grating. It scatters light and splits it into all these colors. And uh, see, this is what happens. The light comes and there are a lot of grooves in the CD and different wavelengths reflect off in different angles. See, here's the box. I have a box. I split, make a slit here. I take a CD. In this case, he has broken the CD into two halves and stuck it at an angle. I mean, you don't need not break it. I didn't break it. I just kept it at 60 degrees. Okay. So you have a slit, which is falling on the CD. And on top, you have a window for, from which you can see it like I have here. I have a window on top. I have a CD at an angle. And uh, I can, okay. So uh, you can see some dark, see this is the kind of lines which appear. This is the spectrum. And uh, it shows you iron and magnesium line here. This dark line is iron. This is hydrogen beta line. This is the iron and calcium line. So depending on uh, what is the what are the chemical elements through which this light is coming through, those get absorbed and they show those signatures on this. So the spectra reveals the temperature, it shows the chemical composition and it shows the velocity. So uh, for example, terrestrial oxygen, it will appear at 759.4 nanometers. Uh, and right, and at 686.7, that is, these are terrestrial oxygen. Hydrogen is at 656.3. Sodium is at 589.6. Right? So from seeing these lines, these dark lines which you see on the spectrum, you can tell what chemical compositions are present in the atmosphere of our atmosphere and of objects which are further off. You can subtract what our atmosphere will give and the things which remain will be the ones which are there in the object there. Right, so these are the kind of spectra you will get if you use CFL, yeah? With the CFL, when I took that, I got this kind of a thing, the tube. Okay, so, and this is the fluorescent tube line. Uh, sir? Yeah. Um, uh, we had tried this out, I had tried this out with my students. Uh, we had kept uh, the CD at an angle of uh, 45 degrees yeah. um, and we had it in a slightly bigger box uh, and we ah. tried to take a picture of, um, we got the spectral lines, we got the Fraunhofer lines, but uh, when we took the picture, I think resolution was becoming a problem. We could not very clearly make out um, uh, the dark absorption lines. Yeah. So, so uh, for that, what probably you should do is if you have a, a SLR camera, the SLR camera, the self-reflecting, yes. right? So yes. what you see is what you are getting. So with that, if you focus well and take it, you should be able to get it. So the window from which you are capturing it 
keep that window big enough for your lens to sit there properly and then you can focus it and take it well if you use a ordinary camera your cell phone and all then it gives a very uh, there's a fixed aperture fixed distance and so on uh we, yeah so if you use an slr camera and do it no then it it should come out fine because uh, we used an slr camera but i was just wondering whether the um line spacing on the cd was uh proper or we have to use something an actual um uh diffraction grating uh, yes yeah can i can i just say something here yeah yeah sure sure okay uh, two things vandana ji um, uh, it, that's a very interesting experiment i have tried it also and yes. two two things uh, you could try uh, one is uh, the slit that is uh, made for the entrance of the light uh huh please make arrangement for varying the width of that so that it is not a fixed width uh by changing that width by by using a slider some kind of a slider if you put over there so that you can change the width of the uh, entrance slit then you will find that at a certain width uh the the uh spectrum looks much sharper and you can get the absorption lines much clearer than at other widths that's one okay and the other thing you could do is uh you could try with a ordinary cd versus a dvd aha uh -huh. so those two uh, you know and combinations of those two might uh, certainly give you better results all right yeah thank you so much thank you you're welcome and uh, the gratings too are available at the market Is there any uh, angle restriction so, so is there any angle restriction no 45 i also did it with 45 uh, i think 45 60 both are fine Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you. It, it just has to make it convenient for you to reflect. See, you have that slit, like we have here, a slit, which is uh, getting the light in, and then you have a window on top from which you are going to see wherever you have. So this CD should be in such a position that you manage to see it properly. That's about all. So I I did a very rough job here, and. Uh, just to show how easy it is to make and you can refine you can make it better and better if i paste these sides up and stop stray light from coming in we'll get a better image right so using a a firmer box and a better one uh, there are templates also available on the net but i didn't want to show it with that because then people will think you have to have that kind of a template to do it you can do it yourself just trial and error you have to get that light coming in and focusing it in such a way that you can see it conveniently at a point and this whole thing if it is in a dark box then you can see those uh, that spectrum clearly that that's that's the idea okay Definitely, so sir, to... we will try it uh, sir uh, i have a question uh, whether we can uh, see the h beta line i don't know no. only yeah. we can see h alpha line you can see front front alpha lines and all you can see front alpha lines you can see very well but in uh, hydrogen spectrum we have six series lyman series and balmer series in balmer series we have two lines h alpha line and h beta lines you were talking about h alpha line yeah, but yeah, what yeah. about h beta line whether we can show h beta line the um, i don't think you'll be able to unless you make a refined spectra meter Yeah. Uh, then you should be able to see it, but with the rough uh, one, which you do it with the CD, and you will not be able to get all those lines so well. Okay, sir, yeah. I will try try my best, and yeah. uh, thanks for providing uh, this idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so now I come to this last uh, aspect of this. One thing we said: this spectrum is important to find the temperature of stars. the chemical composition another one is the velocity uh you can find the velocity with which a star is or an object is coming towards you or going away from you uh this was the phenomena which was used by edwin hubble 
who who looked at galaxies and looked at spectra of galaxies and showed that the the more the distant the galaxy is the faster is it is receding away from us and this was observed by hubble and his uh, assistant hammerson uh, who looked at galaxies in different direction in the sky and they saw that there is a relationship between the velocity of recession and um, and uh, distance to that object and that led to understanding that the universe is expanding and that led to the the the, the today is accepted theory of uh, the big bang of how the universe was created and so on and the, the basic idea was looking at the spectra of galaxies so what happens is we very often hear this people say that there is a red the galaxy is red shifted or blue shifted red shift what do we mean by that what we mean is uh, something like this uh, there is doppler shift which you very often observe when an ambulance or a train is approaching you and going past you as it's coming towards you you see the frequency increase and when it's moving away the frequency gets stretched right so this is you you heard a boom kind of a sound so basically as an object as you see here the police car as it's moving towards the observer on the right the uh, wavelength of the sound coming looks to sound appears to be smaller it is smaller hence it is high frequency while the person on the other end for him these the it gets stretched up so you have um, long wavelengths and the low frequency so what is uh, the change in sound wave you know this change of pitch that is doppler effect for sound for light the same thing comes as uh, color so if it gets stretched then you see a red shift and when it is stretched squeezed up you get the blue shift so what happens is basically these absorption lines or emission lines they get shifted towards the red side or the blue side so if normally if there was no motion if a certain line of a certain uh, chemical uh, should appear at a certain point say 640 nanometers but it is coming at 638 so you say that it is it is getting shifted towards the red side or if it gets pushed beyond then you get blue shifted so each chemical element has its signature and from where uh, from its actual position where it should be it gets this displaced we attribute it to the motion of the object so for example we have this hydrogen lamp and its uh, uh, signature comes exactly somewhere here around 650 nanometers and when you are getting the similar line from a gas cloud in the orion nebula and that line specifically indicates this is this is hydrogen there is no other chemical element you there is no other phenomena which can create this kind of a line so now i will show you these lines you will see these emission lines these are spiking up these are brighter ones absorption lines will be so what you will see is i will give you objects which are further and further off and you see that these spectral lines get shifted away see i'll move it fast see these things are right so each one i am going backwards now this is the orion nebula you have galaxy 12915 yeah ugc 12915 and that that line hydrogen line is shifted further off towards uh, higher wavelengths right and then i have an object which is still ugc 12508 and it has shifted further towards the 
So the further the galaxy, the further the, that line, the hydrogen line is shifting. And that shows the velocity with which it is going. So the change in the this, this displacement which you have uh, by delta V by V, uh, delta lambda by lambda, will show you the velocity of the thing. Okay, so this is what uh, was used. Uh, the spectra was used to find uh, uh, that universe is expanding. This is used to measure distance, speed, velocity with which stars are, uh, say, going away from us or coming towards. There are certain very high, hyper velocity stars which you observe, which uh, you can, which uh, can be observed using spectroscopy. Okay, so with this, I will stop here and thank you. Yeah. So uh, now we will have a 10 minutes break and then we will log back at 3.40. Okay. If there are questions, I can, I'll be here to answer, but those who want to take a break, uh, you can sign off and come back in 10 minutes. So what will we be doing after break? Uh, we'll do the telescopes. Then we will discuss things which we did yesterday. Some of you have done those experiments with the ball mirror and others and, uh, and sent pictures. There. So we'll discuss then also that the other things which we did, we'll have discussions of that. No, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Mm. We are right here, so if there's something you want to ask, you can ask. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. I'll just mute. There's a yes, lot of uh, sound. I will mute to the, you. Just unmute and speak because I'll... you can unmute and okay, speak. Okay, okay. Yeah, now you can. Yes. Yeah, you can ask now. <laughs> 